Good afternoon. Hello? This is Carla Addison. Welcome everyone to the Douglas Laboratories Educational Webinar Series. This is Carla Addison. I am in product research and development at Douglas Laboratories. We are here to listen to the presentation on creatine supplementation, optimizing dosage, timing, and combinations for strength, power, and performance. This is being presented by Kelly Heim. He is a um, presenter who is um, very knowledgeable about this topic. Kelly is a pharmacologist specializing in natural products. Uh, he is a senior director of science. He is the senior director of scientific affairs at Douglas Labs and Clean Athlete. He oversees the scientific integrity and safety of products by maintaining rigorous standards of research evaluation and its application to the product formulation. Dr. Heim earned his doctorate in pharmacology from Dartmouth Medical School and his Bachelor of Science in Nutritional Biochemistry at the University of New Hampshire. His academic research, scholarly reviews, book chapters, and lectures have highlighted evolving concepts in nutrition, genomics, bioavailability, and pharmacology. He is also a Bantamweight bodybuilder and physique competitor who applies evidence-based nutrition and training principles and competes exclusively in all-natural drug-tested events. So um, with this, I just wanted to remind everyone that they are on mute, so all questions will be answered. Um, please submit your questions through the um, through the webinar, um, so you can type in any kind of questions in your chat box, and we will receive them and send those to Kelly as he um, ends his presentation. So with that, I'd like to introduce Kelly. Thank you, Carla, and I'd like to thank all of you for joining me today. And I'm delighted to have this opportunity to talk about a topic that's been of scientific, professional, and personal interest to me for almost 25 years. And for those of you who don't know, there have been over 500 research studies evaluating the effects of creatine supplementation on muscle physiology and or exercise capacity. And whether you're a coach, a trainer, a nutritionist, a physician, or if you're just an athlete yourself or a fitness enthusiast, today I'm going to provide all of the basic information. I'm going to distill that research down to really practical info that you're going to need to apply the science effectively. So before I go on, I just want to disclose that I am employed by the company. I do not have any other conflicts of interest. My opinions don't necessarily reflect those of Douglas Labs or Clean Athlete. So the learning objectives today are shown here. First, I'll uh, allow you to uh, consider performance variables uh, that may or may not be relevant to you that uh, respond favorably to creatine supplementation. So is creatine right for you? Is it right for the athletes that you advise if you're a coach or a trainer? Um, it, it, is it uh, important um, that certain types of athletes avoid it? There are a lot of questions that come up with creatine. Also, you can recognize types of athletes who are more likely to respond than others. I'll, I'll indicate some of those athletes in these slides to come. And then learn what to look for in a supplement. You want a supplement that's going to work. And once you get a high quality product, that's one thing. But how do you use it properly? And I'll show you how. So I'm going to give you up-to-date information on dosage and strategic timing of intake, com uh, combinations with carbohydrate and protein um, and other considerations. And you'll understand how creatine levels are influenced by other factors. The most common questions I've received over the years have been, should I consider creatine? Is it right for me? What can it do for me? What form is best? How much should I take? And are there any risks? So that, so by the time this webinar is over, um, I'll, I'll have all these questions answered for you. And of course, I'll allow time for you to submit your own questions. Just to give you a little bit of history, creatine was identified as a component of meat back in 1832 by a French scientist. And then research on it in a supplement context didn't start until the early 1900s at Harvard University. But it wasn't actually, it wasn't until 1992, right after the Olympics in Barcelona, when consumer industry and academic interest really started to take off. And that is because Linford Christie, who won gold in the 100 meters, and another 100-meter uh, athlete, a hurdler by the name of Colin Jackson, 
both of those athletes told the Times that they had been taking something called creatine in advance of the games. And then there was another article in Bodybuilding Monthly featuring Sally Gunnell, who won gold in the 400 meter hurdles, and also reported taking creatine. It didn't take long for creatine to become commercially available through U.S. retailers. It was the following year, 1993, and I remember it uh, very clearly. Today, it is one of the most widely used sports supplements. So what is creatine? It's an amino acid derivative that carries energy that muscles need, and I'll illustrate that in a moment. Some of it is made in the body, and then some of it comes from food. So you'll make about half of your daily creatine supply inside of your body through the liver, kidneys, and pancreas primarily. And then you'll consume about the uh, approximately half of your body's creatine will come naturally from food, and that is if you consume meat, because meat is the only way you can get creatine from the diet. If you're a vegetarian, that is uh, an important consideration, which I'll, I'll go into momentarily. So the natural role of creatine in the body is to carry energy. And if you remember biology class, uh, or if, you're, if you have a medical degree, you'll remember the ATP is what carries energy that muscles need to contract. Without ATP, we wouldn't be able to live, let alone exercise. The problem with ATP is it's very short-lived. It turns into ADP, which is pretty useless, and has to be regenerated very, very quickly and uh, over and over again, especially during the first 30 seconds of exercise. So creatine regenerates ATP by recharging it. It puts a phosphate group back onto it so that it can continue to mediate those important reactions that culminate in the contraction of skeletal muscle, as well as other types of muscle in the body. So imagine yourself standing on a track, and you're going to run around that track about 400 meters, and in the first three to six seconds, of all-out effort, you're going to really be relying on just stored ATP, but that doesn't last long. It lasts at maximum about six seconds. Creatine really kicks in at that point, so it starts to regenerate that ATP so that you can continue on for maybe another 10 seconds or so. After that, you're really going to be relying on glucose, glycogen, and depending on your intensity, maybe some fat. So it's really in the first brief period of intense anaerobic effort that you're relying on creatine. Creatine is so important that the body evolved with the expectation that you're probably not going to get off of it from food, so better make it on its own. It takes two amino acids that you get in the diet, glycine and arginine, and it ties them together using an enzyme. And then with the help of folate B12 and B6, it adds a methyl group to that compound and then you get creatine. If you have deficiencies in those vitamins, if you have high homocysteine levels, if you have certain genetic mutations, this process might not be optimal. So what happens when you take a supplement for the first time? Within an hour, your blood levels will increase considerably. There will be a very, uh, very rapid absorption. And that's because creatine is highly bioavailable. It's one of the most bioavailable things that we consume actually, it's often close to 100%. The range is between, generally between 90 and 100% bioavailable. So there's no reason to consider bioavailability and selecting a supplement as long as you're going with creatine monohydrate, you're going to get a, a very, very good uh, absorption profile. And then within hours, it goes from the blood into the muscle and is what, it also goes into the brain within, uh, within two hours or so, and then if you take it repeatedly every day, if you take one dose every day indefinitely, you will slowly get an accumulation in muscle tissue. Depending on your genetics, this is entirely genetically determined. You might store seven, uh, a 70 kilogram person might store 120 grams um, or 160 grams. There's a lot of variability in how much creatine an individual can store. So. Some people respond really well to creatine because they're able to store a lot of it. Uh, but there are other factors that determine whether creatine is going to work for an athlete. Creatine enters the brain as well. So it's not just for muscle, it's for brains. It's a critical mediator of energy homeostasis in the brain. It's so important that our brain has these transporters in it that t specifically take creatine and ensure that it gets across. There is an X-linked mutation in this creatine transporter called creatine, 
that results in significant intellectual disabilities. And it is a very exciting topic in psychiatry and neurology, the use of creatine supplements in many clinical contexts outside of exercise. There have been studies on vegetarians who tend to have lower creatine levels because they don't consume any meat, which is a major source of creatine. And there was one study of vegetarians, it was a six-week study, and they took five grams of creatine or placebo each day, and they had significant improvements in multiple measures of cognition, working memory and performance in tasks requiring a high speed of mental processing. So creatine can certainly support brain function in addition to muscle function. So in the beginning of this talk, I did point to ATP regeneration, which is the primary mode of action of creatine from a, from a bioenergetic standpoint. But now we know that creatine has a lot of other effects on the skeletal muscle when it comes to supporting the adaptations to an exercise stimulus, primarily a resistance training program. So creatine will enter muscle cells through the creatine transporter, and when it does, it activates certain signaling pathways involving enzymes that turn on genes that support protein synthesis, and that ultimately supports muscle hypertrophy. It also partially mimics the effects of IGF-1, which is a growth factor that turns on the same pathways. If you consume carbohydrate with your creatine supplement, you are capitalizing on the synergy between the insulin receptor and its downstream functions with creatine's actions and, and methods of uptake. So that's something you can capitalize on. And insulin is also, by the way, the most powerful anabolic hormone in the body. So a post-workout insulin stimulus will expedite not only gains in strength and muscle mass, but in uh, recovery as well, it will expedite recovery. So not only is creatine relevant to performance, lean body mass, and other things that we commonly hear about creatine, which I'll go into in a moment, but it, it may also expedite recovery as well. Should you consider supplementation? If you look at this checklist and any one of these items pertains to you or the athletes you advise, the answer would be yes. If your sport requires short bouts of high intensity effort, of 30 seconds or less, followed by rest, it's an excellent reason to consider creatine. If your sport requires strength or explosive power or involves plyometric training, those are other good reasons to consider it. And this is an important one. If you are a fitness enthusiast, if you're trying to live a healthy, active lifestyle and try to uh, keep, on, keep your lean body mass um, as you get older, if you're just trying to improve your body composition overall, that is a good reason to use creatine. If you're just trying to maintain lean mass for any reason, it's a good reason to use creatine. So uh, vegetarians obviously start out with very low levels at baseline in studies, and they tend to respond more dramatically than non-vegetarian supplementation in both measurements of physical performance and mental performance, like I mentioned. If you're a master's athlete, um, there have been a lot of good studies on older individuals. There was an eight-month study that was pretty cool. Athletes, uh, actually, they were, they were actually adults, not athletes, who were um, engaging in a fitness regimen. And they were over the age of 50. And the group who took creatine at a dose of about six grams a day for a 60 kilogram person, they gained an average of 6.6 .6 pounds of lean mass, while the placebo group only gained an average of one pound. And at the end of the eight weeks, the group that took creatine could lift about 33 pounds more than they could at baseline, while the placebo group could only lift about four additional pounds. So right there, you have a good reason to consider creatine if you are a master's athlete or if you're just trying to support healthy muscle aging. If your sport requires mental focus, as I mentioned, creatine is highly active in the brain. We do need creatine in the brain. Um, it's not always necessary to supplement, but um, it certainly doesn't hurt to consider it. There have actually been studies on sport-specific skills uh, requiring hand-eye coordination. There was a study on rugby players, and they, the researchers subjected them to a, a passing test, so passing the ball. And that requires a lot of mental... Um, mental uh, faculties as well as physical, and creatine supported better performance on that test. There have also been studies on animals uh, showing significant support for spatial memory. So on with probably what is the most highly acclaimed effect of creatine, and that is its effects on body composition. 
Many studies show that creatine may increase strength, fat-free mass, and muscle morphology with concurrent heavy resistance training, more than the resistance training alone. So muscle diameter is, is one way you can measure that. There are a lot of ways you can measure the effects of creatine on muscle, but body composition is pretty easy to measure. Uh, there were three independent studies in which subjects took creatine um, or placebo, and the ones who took creatine gained about twice the body mass or lean mass than placebo. And it amounted to an additional two to four pounds of muscle mass during a four to 12 week period of training. So that's a pretty substantial improvement in body composition over a reasonable, actually a fairly short amount of time. And that lean mass could be a result of a number of things. It could be the result of an enhanced ability to train, the enhanced quality of training uh, due to the regeneration of ATP, or it could be due in part to some of those signaling pathways that I, that I mentioned a few moments ago. So we know that creatine is quite possibly the most effective supplement in sports nutrition, second to protein perhaps. So we know it works, but if we wanted to quantify that effect, how, how would we summarize that? This was, this was a, a meta-analysis that was done um, that showed that the greatest effect of creatine supplementation was observed for weight training variables. And for the number of repetitions, there was an increase from baseline of 45% compared to 22.9% for, for placebo. There was also a 7.4, uh, 7.5 increase in performance in brief high-intensity exercise compared to 4.3% uh, for placebo. Uh, 7.5 increase in short duration high-intensity performance, and that was almost that was almost double the placebo. So these are substantial. Uh, they're not just statistically significant, but they are clinically significant, if you will. So again, how effective is creatine if you want to put some numbers on here? The typical gain in performance according to studies is 10 to 15 percent. When we look at short-term supplementation, often a short-term study is within a seven-day period. There have been very short-term studies done um, using a high dose, which would typically be between 20 and 30 grams per day, otherwise known as a loading dose, and I'll go into that in a minute. These, these studies have demonstrated that supplementation supports maximal power and strength um, at a 5 to 15 percent uh, average increase. Work performed during sec uh, sets of maximal e uh, effort in terms of muscle contractions, 5 to 15 percent. Single effort sprint performance, 1 to 5 percent. Um, not quite as impressive, but still significant. And then work performed during repetitive sprint performance. So if, if you're a runner, a sprint is pretty easy to imagine. If you're a swimmer, we're dealing with short, um, short distances and uh, workouts that involve uh, repeats of short distances. Same with cycling. So um, any exercise that involves very intense, brief uh, anaerobic bouts followed by rest and it's repeated, those are the patterns of training that respond best to creatine. So um, that's, uh, that's a kind of a, a summary of the type of athlete who, who would most likely benefit from creatine. There are some other examples. If you think about sports requiring quick movements that are improved with weight training, like sports that involve throwing or striking or kicking a ball or another object at high velocities, it would make sense to consider creatine. Obviously, powerlifting, bodybuilding, anything involving weight training is a primary uh, stimulus. Um, sports involving jumping, like volleyball, taekwondo, there have been studies on the, those types of athletes that have shown benefit. Um, CrossFit is another um, track and field, the field events. Um, anything involving just really high intensity or dynamic movements. Longer term studies have generally shown a 5 to 15 percent increase in average strength and performance gains. Um, quite a number of studies have used a higher dose uh, or a loading protocol, and they've demonstrated increased power. For example, there was a 5.4% increase in mean power within just seven days of a high dose. And I'll define high dose versus low dose in a minute. But first, let's just touch on safety and tolerability. The only recognized side effect of creatine is weight gain. And the weight gain almost always occurs in the first week. Typically, if you're using a loading dose of 0.3 grams per kilogram body weight, which is typically 20 grams a day for the first three to seven days, 
you'll gain an average of one to five pounds. Usually it's closer to one to three pounds, depending on your existing body weight and also depending on genetic factors that determine how much creatine you assimilate. So that, that's actually a good thing. It's the water that goes into your muscles. It's going into your muscle fibers and having a volumizing effect on the cells. And that is part of what drives protein synthesis. And that's uh, just showing you that the creatine is doing what it's supposed to do. But not every athlete is going to be able to detect that weight gain. Some will say, oh my god, I gained five pounds in one week. And that's, that's not uncommon. And others will say, well, I didn't gain any. Does that mean my creatine is not working? Absolutely not. It doesn't mean that it's not working. It, it's, it's determined by a lot of other factors. But that aside, um, other than some uh, gastrointestinal complaints that are typically observed if you're, if you're taking a really high dose of 10 grams or more at once, um, it has an excellent safety and tolerability profile, a long uh, history of research, lots of clinical trials um, showing um, very, very good tolerability. It's, this has been in widespread use, like I mentioned at the beginning, since the early 90s. So we know a lot about its safety. Um, one thing I will mention is maintain adequate fluid intake at least during the first one to four weeks because you're, you're, you're appropriating fluid inside of the muscle. So that fluid has to come from somewhere. And if you're not drinking an extra pint or so of fluid for every pound that you're, um, that you're gaining, that you, you, you know, which you will if you're, if you're adequately hydrated, you'll be able to redistribute your water um, quite well. You just want to make sure that that, that extra fluid is available. Uh, if not, you might feel a little bit dried out. So here is the dosage recommendation based on the entire history of creatine research. Um, the, there have been so many different uh, dosage protocols in studies, but these two are best represented in terms of producing the most significant impact on the largest variety of training variables. So. The loading period, the loading dose, this is something you hear about a lot, um, to load or not to load. Well, it really is optional. I will tell you that the main reason people decide to load is uh, because a lot of the studies, especially the earlier ones, used a loading protocol. So if you really want to apply evidence-based practices, if you're very diligent about that um, type of approach, then it makes sense. You'll also expedite the, um, the onset of benefit just because you're going to reach the maximal saturation of muscle stores of creatine much faster within two to five days as opposed to within 21 to 28 days, as you'll see below in the maintenance uh, option. But you can load for uh, two to five days using this equation, this 0.3 grams per kilogram per day. Typically, this is four doses of five grams per day. If you have a really heavy athlete, you're going to get closer to maybe 30 grams a day total. Um, but typically, 20 grams a day is a nice rule of thumb if you want to uh, if you want to load. Always divide it in dose in different um, doses at different meals. Take it with meals to optimize absorption. Uh, but four but four times five grams a day is ideal. And then if you want to skip that, it'll just take you a little longer to reach that peak. Uh, you can use two to five grams a day depending on your body weight. Uh, this is optimal for most objectives. Well, typically, um, you know, you'll reach your peak within 21 to 28 days. There have been uh, quite a number of studies that have um, used uh, this over a long term, the loading dose over a longer period of time. So there was a study with that loading dose for eight weeks in highly trained athletes, um, and they found improvements in rate of force development, or RFD, and that's a measure of explosive strength, or how fast an athlete can develop force. Like I said, there are other um, protocols, but these are typically uh, broadly applicable across a number of different sports, and um, typically can't go wrong if you use you know, the maintenance dose indefinitely. Contrary to a lot of things you might hear, it's not necessary to cycle on and off creatine. It is true that if you supplement with creatine, your body will make less, but as soon as you stop, no matter how long you've been taking it, your body will kick that right back in. So it won't lose its ability to make its own creatine. It won't have any negative health effects if you supplement, um, and that downregulates its own synthesis. Lots of people use creatine, but lots of people don't use it correctly. So there are a lot of things you can do to get the most out of your creatine supplement. As I mentioned in the beginning, carbohydrates through activating insulin signaling can augment creatine uptake and its actions. Um, your creatine uptake by muscle 
can increase by as much as 60% if you consume it with a meal containing about 400 calories of carbohydrates. So that's a high carbohydrate dose. Um, you don't need to do that. You can actually combine protein and, and carbs and, and get the same effect. It's generally best to combine creatine with carbs and protein and consume it with, with, within one hour post-workout. So a post-workout shake, a, a really good example would be clean, clean, uh, clean recovery, which contains protein and carbohydrates to facilitate recovery and set the stage for training adaptations in, in muscle. You could add five grams of creatine to that. The clean creatine, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute, uh, it is tasteless, it's very soluble, it's compatible with anything. You could sprinkle it on food, you could mix it with any beverage of your choice. So here is a reference page to, uh, to look at when you're considering using creatine, things that are optimal and things that you probably should try to avoid. On the left, the optimal practices would be either pre-workout or post-workout. Generally, post-workout is best. Mix it with a shake that contains carbs and protein. If you have to take a pre-workout, just make sure you mix it with a carb-containing beverage like a sports drink. On your off days, there's no reason not to take it. You want to keep those muscle stores up. So consume creatine with a meal to make sure that there's enough of an insulin st uh, stimulus to promote assimilation. Divided doses are typically better if you're taking higher uh, doses, but if you're just taking five grams a day, you could just take that in one dose. Make sure to drink plenty of fluids even if you skip a dose. It just helps creatine do what it needs to do. Um, try to avoid taking it on an empty stomach. You won't get uh, nearly as high uh, absorption and bioavailability. If you take with caffeine, now I'm not just talking about a regular cup of coffee. I'm talking about high dose caffeine, about 300 milligrams or above, taken for the sole purpose of enhancing performance. Um, by way of reducing perception of effort, uh, supporting excitation contraction coupling, all the reasons why athletes have been using creatine uh, all these years. It, it, it's definitely possible that that, that, cre uh, that caffeine can interfere with the effects of creatine on muscle performance. And there have been a lot of uh, authors of papers speculating on what, why that might be. And it's not really absorption, it's not pharmacokinetic in nature, it is really um, the opposing effects of caffeine and creatine on muscle contraction and relaxation. It's, a, it's complicated, but just try to uh, avoid taking them at the same time if you're taking a high dose of caffeine. If you're dehydrated, probably not good to take a high dose of creatine. If you're loading uh, during a week um, when you're in a very hot environment, your body might not be used to the, you know, the, the, the switch in, in water weight, you might feel you might feel dehydrated, um, or you might be a little bit more prone to it. This is this is entirely theoretical. There is not um, any scientific evidence out there that shows that creatine causes dehydration. But if you already are dehydrated, and you're not sure how creatine affects you. It might not be the best idea. Clean creatine is a highly versatile supplement. It is easily applied in terms of mixing it with anything of your choosing. It is unflavored. Um, it comes with a five gram scoop to make it very convenient to know how much you're giving and how much you're taking each day. You can take one scoop each day before or after ex exercise, as I mentioned before. Um, each tub contains 60 servings and this is excellent for strength, performance, recovery, all the things that I touched on earlier. Clean Creatine provides Creapure, which is manufactured in Germany and it's extensively tested for purity before shipping and there's a consistent level of high quality. It's fully traceable, it's vegan, allergen free, and non-GMO. So like all clean, uh, clean products, clean creatine is tested for banned substances and um, this is an important aspect of quality at clean that we're very proud of. So. Um, Clean Athlete involves uh, the NSF Certified for Sport program as part of its quality control and quality assurance to meet the growing demands of athletes and healthcare professionals. Uh, there are a lot of things that go into uh, Clean Athlete and, and this testing. So um, the NSF Certified for Sport program it has official rec uh, recognition from a number of sports agencies, including the MLB, MLBPA, NFL, PGA, LGP, LPGA and Collegiate Professional Sports Dietitians Association. And the program provides robust and 
very reliable preventive measures to ensure quality. So this program verifies that what's on the label accurately matches what's in the product. That's really important. And then it also ensures that there aren't any harmful contaminants or adulterants in there. In order to maintain our certification, we have to adhere to very strict manufacturing standards and you have to submit every lot of in product testing. You always want to make sure that your, your creatine supplement has this level of third-party testing. And this program actually tests for over 200 banned substances and in, uh, actually can increase the number of substances it tests for at any time. As we know, that list, the WADA list, is updated periodically. So NSF support um, definitely uh, stays on the cutting edge of that. So if you're not a competitive athlete and you're not getting drug tested, the, the concept is simple. It's one of safety. If professional athletes and Olympians can't take chances when it comes to supplements, neither should you. And it's about finding a reliable supplement that you can really trust and getting that peace of mind that you're getting everything that you need and nothing that you don't. There are many other factors that go into quality assurance at Clean Athlete. Identity verification for creatine. You want to make sure that this is creatine and there's nothing else there. Potency is important. You want to make sure that it's a high potency, a very consistent potency. Microbial contaminants need to be uh, tested. We want to make sure that the creatine is stable throughout its entire shelf life so that you don't get any degradation of any kind. And then uh, heavy metal testing is also important. Physical analysis is another component of quality and of course this all has to be manufactured in an FDA inspected GMP compliant manufacturing facility. So to summarize, here are the answers to the five questions that I presented in the beginning of the talk. Should you consider creatine supplementation? Well, if your goals involve strength, power, and or body composition, or if you're vegetarian, um, there are some other things that I mentioned, you should consider supplementation. What can it do for you? It can support ath uh, athletic performance, primary, primarily anaerobic performance that is of a uh, short intermittent nature and strength and mass uh, gains as well as any um, objectives invo involving body composition. Five grams a day is optimal for most in terms of dosage and creatine monohydrate is the most well-researched creatine preparation that you can buy. It's very bioavailable. There's really no reason in the case of creatine to consider alternate uh, forms when it comes to um, just looking at the evidence being so compelling for this form. It's very stable, it's very soluble. It's backed by more research than any other form. Are there any risks? No. Uh, safety um, is well documented in, in the clinical trials that have been done to date in healthy individuals. If you do have a kidney condition or a liver condition, it may be advisable to avoid creatine. Uh, it, 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 may, um, you know, it may worsen a kidney um, condition, but it has never been shown to induce a kidney um, issue. So if you're healthy, then there's no reason to consider any, uh, that there might be any risks associated with creatine. Obtaining a high quality creatine supplement is one thing. Having the information to apply that supplement in a way that's going to support the exercise performance and health of your athletes. If you're an athlete yourself, uh, your health is important. We realize that providing high quality products is just part of the puzzle. We want to make sure that we keep our door open so that you have a resource to go to that you can really trust to get the most accurate, up-to-date information on how to use uh, supplements in sports nutrition. So please feel free to contact me anytime at my email address below and my colleague Adam Branfman who is the brand manager. And I also want to extend this offer to you. Just mention creatine0117 for this 15% off and free shipping on your next order. So without any further delay, I want to open up the room for questions. I certainly want to thank you for your attention and attendance today. Okay, Kelly, this is a question um, that came in. What is the difference between clean BCAA and clean creatine? Should one be taken over another, or can both be taken? Excellent question. They are not similar at all. They are two completely different things, and it makes perfect sense to use both of them. They both support uh, similar components of training and performance. I'll give you a very brief uh, description of the difference. So creatine is uh, a compound that helps with muscle adaptations to training 
in the sense that it supports uh, not only protein synthesis, but the energy production in, in muscle cells. So it helps with the energy production of cells, whereas BCAA doesn't really necessarily support energy production, but it helps to mitigate the, the use of protein for that energy. So there's a little bit of a difference in, in what they do. But the general applications are, uh, are pretty similar in terms of what types of athletes would benefit from creatine when you consider um, you know, the athletes that are engaged in high intensity intermittent bouts of, of uh, anaerobic work. Those are the, the exact same type of athletes who tend to benefit very well from BCAA as well. You can mix both of them in the same beverage. The clean BCA has a really nice flavor, it's a nice orange flavor, orange flavor. You can add that five grams of creatine directly to that beverage to make it really easy, it tastes great. Um, that would be an excellent pre-workout. You can also, um, you know, BCA is very versatile. You could use a post-workout. So those these products are very easy to uh, to combine. All right, thank you for that, Kelly. And then we have another question. Uh, this one is um, thanking you for the clinical studies, and they were wondering if any of the studies you mentioned included women as the subjects. And just to tag on to that, um, there was someone else who wondered if creatine was safe during pregnancy. Okay, we'll start with female athletes. Initially, uh, a long time ago, um, the, a lot of the researchers were, were wondering, you know, would this affect women differently? But looking back at the, the, the totality of the evidence, there is no difference between the effects of creatine in women and the effects in men. So um, no, there is no reason to um, to suspect that women wouldn't benefit as much, um, or that the the dose would have to be. Obviously, the dose might be lower uh, if you're going for uh, the gram per kilogram guideline that I presented at one of the slides. It, you know, women t tend to be smaller, um, but that's the only differential um, consideration that that would apply here. And then going on to the the pregnancy question, there's not enough evidence to support the use of creatine during pregnancy. Um, there just hasn't been enough uh, research in that area, so we recommend avoiding it for that reason. Okay, thanks Kelly. Uh, the next question, are there any considerations for age specific to high school male athletes? Well, I will t I'll tell you, I was in high school when this uh, when the Barcelona Olympics was going on. <laughs> I, was th I actually received a lot of promotional literature on, uh, on creatine, but I I looked at the science. I was um, I was the kind of kid who went home on Friday nights and and read biochemistry instead of going to parties, <laughs> and I, I I just didn't think that the science was there. But that was that was 25 years ago, and um, I will say that there are there are no known safety concerns associated with creatine supplementation in healthy people. Uh, a large proportion of studies have, have been conducted in both male and female participants between tw between 18 and 24 years of age. But the argument against creatine use in younger individuals under 18 makes sense primarily because there is a lack of substantial published evidence examining its effects in general, be, the, be it positive or negative effects, in younger age groups. So we just don't have enough information to really make a sound recommendation. So for that reason, we don't recommend the use of clean creatine individuals under the age of 18. And um, that, that's generally reflecting also the consensus of other organizations like uh, AC, uh, ACSM, AAP, and Drug Drug Free Sport. There's, there's really not enough information to um, to confidently recommend creatine in younger people. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Uh, we we are getting a lot of questions, so. Um, you know, we're just going to try to get to as many as we can. Um, one question that does keep coming up is if these slides will be available. Um, and these, this webinar is being recorded. So after this meeting, uh, after this um, webinar, we will have the whole presentation available on the Douglas uh, Labs website. So that's douglaslabs.com. Um, so that's to answer those questions for those who have, um, we've gotten a few of these. So there's a question here, Kelly, that, that there was a recommendation to avoid taking creatine with fruit juice. 
and is that a factor if you're mixing it with concentrated um, cherry juice to reduce inflammation and antioxidants? Great question. There, there's a lot of uh, a lot of discussion and, and and misguided discourse, if you will, on combining creatine with acidic beverages. Um, thinking that creatine might uh, might degrade with that low pH if you're combining with fruit juices that have a lower pH. Uh, I will say uh, with 100% confidence that that is not rooted in science. Uh, that's um, it, it's actually it's nothing that you need to be concerned of because when you know when creatine hits the stomach, the pH is two or less, and we know that even then the bioavailability is between 90 and 100%. If you mix something in, in fruit juice, the stability should not be affected. Um, you can combine a creatine with anything you want. Um, the, the fruit juices offer the benefit of having a high glycemic carbohydrate, depending on the kind of juice that you're consuming. Um, it just makes it easier. I, I personally like to mix it with grape juice and, and uh, clean recovery. Those are my two favorite things to mix it with, just because I already take those things for um, nitric oxide support. That's why I use the grape juice for that. and also. Um, the clean recovery is just such a great tasting post-workout that I, I love it. I just love combining things with that. Um, creatine is entirely compatible with that. But to answer your question, there's no no re no reason um, to be concerned about uh, the stability when you're mixing with certain things. One thing that I will advise is don't mix your creatine with a beverage and let it sit for long periods of time. It is possible for creatine to degrade. Um, so, you know, if you can, just mix it and drink it. Um, you know, within a few minutes, or you just don't let let it sit out for hours. All right, there's two more questions that we're going to ask. The first one is, why are there so many buffered creatines on the market? And um, what you know, is there a difference between the buffered and the monohydrate? I'm aware of uh, buffered creatines. Um, you, you will get uh, a highly available product if you just use creatine monohydrate like I mentioned. There are a lot of other forms of creatine on the market, but they are not nearly as well researched and validated as creatine monohydrate. It's questionable as to whether they are superior either in tolerability or other factors related to performance or, or uptake by muscle. I have read a lot of the research on um, buffered creatines and uh, it's generally not very convincing. So I personally use the monohydrate. I recommend it to every athlete that I advise. And um, any scholar that has been researching creatine all this time will tell you exactly the same thing. All right. Well, um, that is all the time that we do have for the presentation. Um, we want to thank Kelly for his time and answering our questions and his vast amount of knowledge on this particular topic and advising um, safety and making sure that um, we are um, maintaining um, a very efficacious product in the clean acid line. So thank you all for attending. We do have the coupon code. Uh, that is available, and you'll get a reminder email tomorrow with that coupon code information. So look for that in your inbox. We will have this recording on the DouglasLabs.com website as early as tomorrow. So you can check that for a refresher, and thank you all. Thank you, Carla, and I'd like to thank all of you for joining today. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Kelly. Goodbye.